In today's video, I'm going to talk about things that appear to be metal, but aren't actually metal in any way, shape, or form. So, non-metallic metal. It's when something appears to be metal, but it certainly is not metal at all. Traditional artists have been painting non-metallic metals for literally centuries. It was never known as non-metallic metals. It was just painting metal in two-dimensional form. Non-metallic metal is not a term that we've coined as miniature artists, but it's definitely something that we have taken ownership on. It's something we're all enamored by, and rightfully so. It's gorgeous when it's executed properly. It's just one of the most striking techniques that we can do as miniature painters. We're not doing it on the two-dimensional level like our renaissance forefathers, but to apply it to a three-dimensional platform such as miniature painting is equally as challenging to convince the eye of the person appreciating the piece that yes, this is a metallic piece of metal when it truly isn't. It's actually painted with pure opaque pigments. What I'm covering today is not necessarily the full spectrum of traditional non-metallic metal. It's actually what I call stylized non-metallic metal. If there's a term for this style out there, I don't really know it. And I don't really claim to know everything, despite how awesome I really am. But seriously, I just like to roll with things. And if I don't know a name for it, I just kind of give it a name that makes sense to me. Helps me kind of understand things better. I like to develop my own lingo for things, so don't get too wrapped up on what I'm calling it. It's just what works for me. So let's talk about stylized non-metallic metal, what it means and how to execute it before we get into the live examples in the video. It doesn't always follow the laws of perfect light and how that light is applied to a reflection. You're going to need a dark color and a light color, obviously. Contrast is king. Contrast is simply the relationship between a dark color and a light color and how they affect each other and essentially make the piece pop. Of course, the stylization comes in the fact that we're not necessarily using traditional colors like browns, ochres, uh, ivories, etc. for golds or grays, blacks, whites, blues, whatever it is that you want to use to provide a cold steel kind of look in a non-metallic metal. In this case, you could use a green and a purple. You could use a red and a blue. Whatever you're choosing, it's a very stylized reflection. And though it will read as a metallic, we know that typically metallics aren't these colors when they're painted as a non-metallic metal. Traditionally, we're going with our golds, our coppers, our bronzes, silvers, etc. With the stylized method, whatever it actually is, the rules are much more loose than if you were doing that knight in a beautiful set of armor, polished to all hell and back. And those loose rules also include the rules of light. We do want to focus on those rules of light, but we can break those rules. No matter which method of non-metallic metal you're doing, the one thing I want you to always remember is that your dark should always but up with your lights. Now, we are going to build a, a transition in this, but regardless, we're going to have a light next to a dark. We're going to have a dark next to a light, and then we're going to have that light next to a dark, which in turn, of course, goes back and forth between the light again. This is known as dark light juxtaposition. The main takeaway from this big fancy word is that it is the relationship between two contrasting colors and its ability to make something stand out. That's what we get the pop of a non-metallic metal from. For an example, obviously Space Bro here, his chest is not metallic, but the way that the artist has rendered Space Bro here, it reads as metallic, right? It's the contrast of the darks against the lights. Now I can't really see it because it's facing you fine folks but i'm going to look at the top here and try and explain it the best i can right you can pull up this picture on the internet pay attention to the darks are literally butting right up against the lights 
so on and so forth. That contrast is going to give us the pop and give us what we need to make this read as a metallic, despite being a two-dimensional non-metallic paint. So in this video, I'm going to cover both traditional brushwork as well as airbrush work. I think that way we can make everybody happy in this and hopefully help get your miniatures to pop a little bit better on the table or even use this as a display quality paint skill technique whatever you want to call it. but before we jump into it i'd like to do something that i typically reserve for the end of my videos that i'm just going to toss here before the meat and potatoes of the video is please if you enjoy the video or any of my other videos hit the subscribe button hit the little bell it's going to help me out big time. I'm trying to grow this channel, trying to get into a more consistent format. So by helping me out with that subscribe, you'll be able to get notifications as soon as I release any videos. I got some really cool videos coming up. Hit that subscribe button. I also stream on Twitch three nights weekly, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then again, Saturday at 4.30 p.m. Now, if you're watching this three years in the future, that time schedule might have changed. So your best bet is to check out my social media platforms. Facebook and Instagram are probably my two most active. Check them out. I'll put links in the bottom below. Of course, I also teach one-on-one -on -one classes. Typically in non-COVID times, I'm actually traveling the country teaching at Adepticon, Gen Con, Warfare Weekend, Origins, a bunch of different conventions that I'm sure you're all at as well. And this is how I actually make my full-time income. So I also run a Patreon campaign where I'm teaching one-on-one -on -one lessons. I'm very close to full up and completely booked out for one-on-one -on -one classes. However, comma, I do have a few slots still open. Another great aspect of my Patreon is the ever popular Loot Crate style tier as well. I'll leave a link down below. You can check out my Patreon campaign. Everyone who contributes literally is helping me to continue to do what I love to do for a living. I really do enjoy doing these things for you all. So check out any one of those options. It's a big help to me. And even if you don't click on any, any of those links, subscribe or anything, I will have a link down below. It's a link tree link for everything. There are links to all of my sponsors i feel like i just said link a hundred times in the last sentence but anyway all those sponsors have discount codes links there it is again i'm sorry the point is there are discounts available to you including monument pro acryl your first purchase is 10 percent off so check it out down below show some love to my sponsors who have been backing me for the last two years as a full-time artist. So let's get into it, huh? All right, so this whole effect throughout the video is going to be done with two Monument Pro Acryl colors, dark warm gray and bright neutral gray. These are the main two colors. Now, remember in the intro, I said that we're always going to push our contrast. Darks are going to be next to the light. So I'm going to start with a dark and a light. I'm going to go dark on the bottom, light on top, and then on the other side of the blade, where the center line is, I'm going to flip-flop it and put a light next to that dark, and so on and so forth. Now I'm just going to start off with a quick little wet blend here. This isn't a wet blend video, so I'm not going to go through the tasks of achieving a wet blend. But the main thing is, don't be too sloppy with it. You don't want to go too far over that center line. Make sure that you get a decent blend, but you're not going to achieve a perfect, buttery, smooth blend, especially when you're working with acrylics in this format in such a small space. So don't necessarily sit there and freak out over it being a crisp blend, but make sure that it's an effective blend. And now remember I said keep your darks next to your lights and vice versa. So we're going to invert how we painted that right side of the blade on the left side we're going to go dark on top light on bottom and we're going to do our blend again being careful not to get too sloppy and going over that center line don't worry about refining anything we're going to do that all with a glaze i am doing some back and forth here to try and get as close to a smooth blend as possible but i know in my mind that i'm not going to get a perfectly smooth blend so i'm just refining going back in and dumping a little bit more of that bright neutral gray towards the 
most saturated area. That very end of the hilt, whatever you want to call it, plus the very tip of the blade. And doing the same with the dark warm gray. Kind of going back and forth just to build it back up. Now we've got these transitions here that kind of overlap, and I want to really kind of tighten those up. And I'm going to use a, a glaze here, but this glaze is like dirty paint water. You can see how thin that is. So I'm going to start about three quarters of the way up the blade, and I'm going to just pull towards the most saturated area of the color that I'm working with. In this case, the dark warm gray. I'm starting three quarters of the way down the blade and pulling it up to the point where it's the darkest. And on the other side, three quarters up down to the hilt where it's darkest. And I'm just going to work back and forth between dark warm gray and the bright neutral gray. Back and forth, layering glazes over each and that's going to help really refine and put together that blend that we're looking for. Just keep working back and forth until you achieve what you're satisfied with. And now I'm just refining a little bit of the edge here. There might be a little bit of a spot that you've gotten a little more paint from the other side than you want. You can come back with a little more opacity in your paint and start building that back in. And now I'm going to go back and forth feathering a little bit. You know, this is this is where we're doing our refining. So it shouldn't take you all day to get there, but you definitely want to make it refined enough to be convincing. So there's our base work. Now we've got an edge highlighted to give it that shine. We haven't used any white at this point because now we're going to jump into bold titanium white. The best white in the game, in my opinion. This is what we're going to use to show that reflective edge on those ever so sharp edges of the, the sword. Now notice, I'm using a size 4 throughout this entire video. I'm a masochist, I like to work in giant brush sizes, but for this point, Specifically, I want you guys to really try and concentrate on using a bigger brush because it holds more moisture in its belly and that will in turn make the paint come off of your brush much more easy. When we're edge highlighting, especially in this effect, we really want it to be crisp. Notice that I'm striking the brush. I'm almost doing like golf swings, if you will, where the first two, three, four passes, I'm not even putting paint on the miniature. That's how light my brush pressure is. Especially here on the center line of the brush, watch me go back and forth a couple of times and there's no paint being transferred on. That's just because that's not me taking a practice swing. Even with my crazy ass shakes right now, I'm able to get a crisp, beautiful line because I'm taking my time with very light brush pressure. So there it is. That's the brushwork side. Let's go on to the airbrush. So I did the, the brushwork on this side. I want to do the airbrush on this side. Again, we're going to transfer the colors from the other side. Now to achieve a perfectly sharp line, I like to use a little bit of masking tape. This is just Tamiya, Tamiya, whatever you call it. Uh, this stuff's great because it's not necessarily going to pull up paint. So I put it right across the center line of the blade and we're going to transfer from the other side the dark warm gray that's at the bottom hilt, we're going to match it, right? I'm going to use my Badger Sotar 2020. It's a little more of a fine detail brush with a 0.2 needle. I like that for these tight little transitions like this. I'm going to thin my paint down to about, I want to say somewhere in the realm of 6 to 8 to 1. 6 to 1 to 8 to 1. And I'm going to feather it out. The dark is going to be towards the, the point of the sword. So I'm going to aim towards the point of the sword. And the bottom of the cone of the spray out of the brush is going to be hitting perfectly at the tip of the brush, right? Or the tip of the sword. So now we've got this nice little natural transition towards the center. Now we jump back into our light neutral gray and we do the opposite. We're pointing towards the hilt of the sword. And we're going to let that bottom edge of the cone of spray out of the airbrush hit perfectly right where that transition from the blade to the hilt is. That way it kind of naturally feathers out towards the center of the blade. Of course, I'm going to come back in. Remember, we're working in glazes even in our airbrush here. I'm going to come back in and refine, refine that transition. 
go back and forth a little bit. But with an airbrush, I got to dump the pot. So I'm just going to feather it out a little bit, glazing, until I get a really clean transition. And here you can see it, but it's a little difficult to see with the tape on. So let's pull this tape off so you can really appreciate the blend. And then we'll speed through the other side real quick. And there you go. You can see a nice, clean, beautiful transition. I'm going to set up the tape again once it's dry after a couple of minutes. And I'm just going to do the opposite of what I did on the other side of the blade. So I've got dark towards the hilt this time and light towards the tip. So I'm just going to power through this in a speedy fashion where I've already showed it to you on the other side. Repeat exactly what you did on the other side. Feather it out a little bit. Go back to your light color. I always start with the dark for some reason. There's no rhyme or reason there, but I like to start with the dark and end with the light. Now look at those. It's beautiful transitions there. I already showed you how to edge highlight. Replicate that on the other side. Now let's make this a true power sword with a power sword glow, if you will. I got to highlight those diodes first, though. So I'm just going to use that uh, bright neutral gray to highlight all of the diodes. There's three on this sword. I highlighted it, then I black lined it. That's, that's not necessary. But then I also glossed it. That is necessary. That gloss will help break up the surface tension of the paint in the next step. So we're going to use transparent blue and bold titanium white here in a mix. I'm going to take this transparent blue and I'm just going to show you exactly what it is. It It's a paint. Okay, it's not an ink, so it's not super thin, but it's very pigment rich, but it has a great transparent property to it. So I just wanted to kind of illustrate to, that to you if you haven't worked with this yet. It's amazing paint. So I'm going to mix this about, I don't know, three to one here with a Lamian medium. And I'm going to take the ever slightest amount of bold titanium white here, and I'm going to mix it in there. And I get too much on there. You don't want to turn this milky white, but it'll give your paint just a little bit of body, a little bit of uh, smokiness, if you will. And I'm going to dab that into the creases right up against that diode, that diode where it meets the sword. I don't know if it's a diode, but that's what I'm going to call it, okay? Um, but anyway, you just dot it along that diode's edge where it meets the sword and fill up each little crevasse, if you will, crevassier. Just make sure you get all the way around the sword there. Every edge, make a nice consistent line there. And it looks pretty good just like that. You could leave it there, but I like it to look a little more glowy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to thin down that glaze even more so. This would be about 5 or 6 to 1, almost, not quite, but almost dirty paint water. And just glaze it in like you would to the effect or degree that you want. I don't want it to be insanely glowy, but I do want it to have a transition out. So there it is. Looks pretty damn good. Now we got to re-highlight that diode, right? So I'm going to take that glaze and I'm going to add a little bit of the bright neutral gray, a little more of the transparent blue, and a little bit of the bold titanium white to get this kind of blue, bright, desaturated blue highlight. I don't want to go to pure white. I don't want to go back to the gray because it's glowing. But in order to sell that glow effect, I've got to make it look brighter at the diode, the source of the energy. So I've added those grays and those whites. There you go.